Julie, when did you start practicing yoga? I started practicing yoga in the late 1960s when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And did Hatha yoga at that time, that's what was available. And when I went to college, I started teaching a little class for my friends. And people started saying that their low back didn't hurt anymore since they started taking the class or they didn't have headaches anymore. And so I decided that I wanted to get some letters after my name um, so that I could work one-on-one -on -one with people and use yoga. Mm -hmm. And that would have been the early 1970s. So I went to physical therapy school. I graduated from there in 77 and then took my first Iyengar class in 79. Okay. So really the yoga came first mm -hmm. and then the physical therapy and then the Iyengar yoga and I have been working ever since to integrate the knowledge I have about the body, how the body works, how the joints work, how the muscles work to integrate that into the yoga poses. And did you study directly with Mr. Iyengar? I have studied directly with him, um, with Gita Iyengar, and with many of the senior teachers in this country, in the United States. And of course his cues and ins instructions um, are very specific about the alignment that he wants. and. So I would listen to cues either from him or from the senior teachers and go back to my anatomy books, my kinesiology books, and study and figure out what did that cue mean in terms of what the body was doing. And so a classic example of that is he would say, cut in your outer calf. And so going back to the anatomy book, I figured out it was fibularis longus that he wanted on the outer calf. And the job of that muscle is to press down the base of the big toe. So that cue was to help give us more stability and more connection to the earth through the big toe. But um, it took quite a bit of time and all those years of listening to the cues and going back to the anatomy books and the kinesiology books and working with the cues in my own body to figure out what was the anatomy that we were trying to get. I love, um, well I have a very sequential way of teaching mm -hmm. and I love seeing the light bulb go off when I sort of set the stage and build it up and then people can feel it in their own bodies. That's a wonderful moment, that's the discovery of um, people being present in their body and really feeling how it's supposed to work. Okay. So as a physical therapist and as a yoga teacher, how do you feel those two uh, awarenesses of the body complement each other? Well, as I've said um, in every workshop I've taught, I strongly believe that yoga is a practice of healing. and. So to make the healing powers of yoga available to people who are injured or sick, um, I feel very strongly about. Um, that means that often I need to break the poses down into simpler pieces that even people who are debilitated or very limited in their abilities um, to meet the people where they are and give them things that they can do and be successful at rather than giving them something that's too challenging and so they won't continue, they won't come back to class or they won't come back to see me again because they get frustrated and overwhelmed or possibly make their problem feel worse. So one of the things I enjoy doing is assessing the problem and then bringing them the yoga poses that they can do successfully so they have a taste of success and they feel better after the session mm -hmm. and then they want to come back and learn more and continue progressing. Mm -hmm. 
Now, it also works the other way because as physical therapists working with people who are injured, we have a really good understanding of what parts of the body are vulnerable to injury, what parts of the body people are weak or tight, and how that can contribute to people getting injured, having overuse injuries, um, having stresses and strains, so that we can then teach the yoga poses so that, again, we meet people where they are, we're aware of where they're probably weak. So for example, the mid-back area is often a very weak area that people need to, to strengthen. Um, muscles around the knees often need to be strengthened. And so we teach yoga in a way that is sort of respecting people's vulnerabilities and building up the strength, building up uh, more flexibility around the hips so that as they progress in yoga, they won't get hurt doing the poses. They won't be pushed um, in a direction. If their hips are too tight, then they're likely to overwork their knees. Um, to compensate for how the hips aren't moving and then they get a knee injury. So I think the physical therapist knowledge is reflected in a very progressive and sequential way that we teach the poses to Westerners. And then we also like to bring all of the wonderful healing back to uh, injured, injured people. Do people perhaps start as a physical therapist client yeah. and turn into a long-term yoga client. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have a lot of people, um, actually many of the people that come to us for physical therapy are coming because they know that we use yoga. And then they come in with their knee problem or their back problem, or their neck shoulder problem. And we use yoga during the therapy sessions. And then if they want to come to a class, we recommend we have five different levels, which would be the right level for them to come into. So they don't re-injure themselves and they can progress and build up from there. Um, so it, it can work really well if people come in <clears throat> for physical therapy and then want to continue in yoga because we can continue to supervise them and make sure that they don't get themselves into trouble in class. So here we're doing a lot of dynamic forms of yoga. So Ashtanga, Vinyasa, and this is very popular in the yoga world right now. And so sometimes we're getting small injuries. Do you think that um, you know, this is an effect of the dynamic poses that we do and maybe not understanding the anatomical alignment behind the poses and if that's the case how do we know as a as a yoga practitioner when to back off or when it's just maybe normal discomfort from the muscles getting used to different positions in the body if i was queen of the world i would have people learn the poses first in a static form and then learn how to string them together. Mm -hmm. Because my concern is that we all come to yoga with misalignments, <coughs> mm -hmm. muscle imbalances, mm -hmm. and if people go straight into the dynamic form, they are just going to be repeating over and over again their misalignments. Mm -hmm. And Hopefully they learn to improve the alignment during the course of the practice, but not everybody does. Mm -hmm. So to me, the optimal would be to teach them how to do the pose first. Um, what's the knee alignment supposed to be? What's the pelvis and low back alignment supposed to be? And then start stringing them together. There's actually a, a flow yoga studio in my city that sends their students to us to learn the poses and then come back to learn the flow, which I think is really cool. Um, the nature of progressing in a physical activity means that you have to expand your limits. So sometimes people are going to overdo, they're going to overstretch or overwork. 
I would hope that by practicing mindfully and listening to your body, that you get a sense of how far can you push. And muscle pain, <clears throat> kind of that worked muscle, tired muscle pain is okay because you have to push a muscle a bit to get it stronger. But I have found that people have very poor judgment about what kind of pain is okay and what is not okay. So when you feel pain right around a joint, so right in the knee, right in the hip, most people don't even know where the hip joint is, it's right here. So pain in the hip, pain in the shoulder, pain in the elbow, those are pain that, is not, that are not good pain. So the muscles are kind of in between the joints and we can work them and push them a bit and they should get stronger. If you add a little bit each time, they will get stronger. Um, so at home, <clears throat> people who are doing running, for example, they're supposed to increase by no more than 10% a week, the distance that they're running. And I kind of use that as a loose example. So if you're used to doing 10, sal t sorry, 10 sun salutations, you should not go from 10 to 20 because that's 100%. There's people that are gonna do it. If you go from 10 to 11 or 10 to 12 and add one sun salutation a week, that's easier for your body to accommodate. Now people often do not have good judgment about intensity of pain. And so they get pain and they keep pushing. And it seems to be the the Western way, I think our egos get wrapped up in it, but I think people can learn about crossing the line into pain that's too intense or too enduring. But I err on the side of keeping pain on the mild side and gradually building up, and it's been very successful for our studio. We, we don't have people with serious injuries, um, hardly ever. And we have people that have been able to stay with the practice and stay at the studio for 15, 20, 25 years and, and basically not get hurt or nothing more than a little temporary overworking. So we encourage people a lot to listen to pain and respect it. Mm -hmm. Which is listening is part of your practice. Listening is supposed to be what we're doing. We're supposed to be practicing consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what kind of suggestions do you have to the aging yoga practitioner? Like I've been practicing for over 20 years and lots of changes mm -hmm. are happening in my body as I age mm -hmm. between having children and um, just the natural occurrences of change with age. Wear and tear and menopause for women. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All of those are going to affect our physical abilities. Um, again, I think it all boils down to the listening. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Mr. Iyengar had a very active practice right up to the end, although he did modify. I understand, I didn't witness this personally, but I, from someone that I trust, that he still did a lot of standing poses, mm -hmm. but he would do them uh, sometimes with, against the wall, with his back to the wall. So for example, he would do Ardha Chandrasana for five minutes against the wall. Wow. Because many people, and possibly Mr. Iyengar, our balance is not as good as we get older. Mm -hmm. So many um, experienced and serious practitioners I've talked to, and I'm starting to get into that range myself, say that the very active what I call Rambo practice, gets to be less important as you get into your 60s, 70s, 80s, and still have an active practice, but maybe not pushing for the extreme positions as much. And that pranayama and meditation and chanting become more important. Um, so I would like to still think about the eight limbs, the, of course the bottom, the foundation is the yamas and the niyamas, which we continue practicing and studying for a lifetime, and then the asana, and then with practice and experience, as your, as your own practice becomes more refined, 
that there's more focus on the pranayama um, and forms of meditation and concentration. Um, especially as I've gotten older, if I do hurt myself, uh, many people know I had a fall, sprained my ankle a couple years ago. It takes a lot longer to heal. And so I'm less willing to risk hurting myself doing some wild thing or having a teacher push me inappropriately. So I'm going to be aware of my limits. I'm going to work with my limits, but I don't want to get pushed in a big way at my age because the, the price that I have to pay for healing has, has gotten, the time range has gotten much longer to heal. I would rather be able to practice in a more moderate form. As I said today, right up till the last day of my life, I'd like to have some kind of practice going. And if I've trashed myself in the earlier years, it's going to be harder to do that. For sure. Yeah. So I like that image as I look out over whatever years I may have, that the practice will continue to, to be there, an important part of my life. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you.